Okay, well, I think we're ready to go, um, as far as I can tell. I'd like to uh, welcome everybody to what is, I believe, the first conversation in a series that is itself part of a longer process of committing UMass Boston to becoming a leading anti-racist and health-promoting public university. Um, before introducing uh, today's panel, I'll briefly mention subs the subsequent fall conversation and ask people to essentially save the date. Um, so on Thursday, October 29th, also from 6.30 to 8.30, there will be a second conversation. This will be moderated by Professor Denise Patman um, and include another wonderful group of panelists, including State Rep Liz Miranda. Uh, then on Thursday, November 19th, same time, 6.30 to 8.30, there will be a third conversation on Black Lives Matter, which will be moderated by Professor Khabibi Mack Shelton um, and center around a discussion with social justice activist Fania Davis. Um, if you don't know who Ms. Davis is, well, Google her while um, I'm talking because you will be excited. This should be a very interesting conversation and event. Uh, then on Thursday, December 3rd, at the same time, we'll have the final conversation of the semester that is appropriately called, Where Do We Go From Here?, which will be moderated by Professor Elizabeth uh, Sweet. So please save those dates. You'll notice they are all on Thursdays from 6.30 to 8.30, so very easy um, to remember. Um, I'm Steve Striffler, by the way. I'm uh, president of the Faculty Staff Union and also the director of the Labor Resource Center, and I have kind of the honor of introducing uh, tonight's panel, um, which is entitled, An Anti-Racism and Health-Promoting Campus Conversation, uh, challenges and opportunities. Uh, it will be moderated uh, by Professor Jemadari Kamara from the Africana Studies Department. Uh, he is a former dean, actually, of the College of Public and Community Service here at UMass Boston, uh, the ACPCS. Uh, he served as chair of Africana Studies on more than one occasion and has been working on racial justice issues on campus in Boston and really globally for decades, so we're in, in great hands here tonight. Um, our panelists include um, our still relatively new chancellor, uh, Marcelo Suarez Orozco. Uh, he comes to us most recently from UCLA. Um, and in both his scholarship and really his role as an administrator, he's demonstrated a real commitment to the very issues that these conversations are intended to address. Uh, we also have interim provost Emily McDermott, who brings her wealth of knowledge really about UMass Boston to the conversation, as well as the provost office commitment to making uh, the university an anti-racist leader. Uh, Professor Tara Parker is the chair of the Department of Leadership and Education and a gifted scholar of higher education policy. Um, I'd really encourage everyone to read the Cypher report. Um, she was instrumental in this. It was a collective effort that emerged from her department. It's really a powerful statement um, and intervention into the very issues we'll be talking about here tonight. Uh, Professor Tim Sieber from the Anthropology Department will also lend his insights. Um, Tim has been working on these very issues at UMass Boston, I would say for better part of 50 years. Um, so he has a lot to bring to the conversation. Dean Linda Thompson from the College of Nursing really truly has an astounding career within higher ed, but also within public policy, the public sphere, government, um, particularly around children and youth, but we really look forward to hearing from her as well. Um, Janelle Quarles, is, Quarles, of course, is the president of our classified staff union here at um, UMass Boston. She's also a union leader within the MTA and on the national level and will share her experience and commitment on these issues. Uh, we also have Professor Patricia Kruger Penny from Urban Education Leadership and Policy Studies. She's going to contribute as well. She's an expert in education po policies and urban school systems and we're excited to hear from her. And finally, Celine Voyard, an undergraduate student, uh, also a major in labor studies who's extremely active in campus and community politics, also just very thoughtful and she'll share her wisdom as well. So we really have um, I think an exciting group uh, here tonight to engage with and, and get this conversation going. Um, before turning it over to Gemadar, I'd just like to end with a quick comment and an acknowledgement. Um, the comment is that becoming a, a leading anti-racist and health promoting public university requires work, uh, labor from administrators, faculty, staff, students, community members, et cetera. Um, for faculty, um, for some reason we call this work service, something that is often, I think, undervalued, largely undervalued at universities in general. Um, and the problem with undervaluing service, I think, as we know, is that, well, if all faculty did the minimal amount of service technically required from them, and which we do get some credit for, uh, the university probably wouldn't function, or at least it wouldn't be um, the kind of place we want it to be. Um, and this is true for all faculty, but I think especially for NTT faculty, who in some ways are often seen as just being supposed to teach, um, and yet if they withdrew their service uh, tomorrow, <laughs> the infrastructure probably of the university might uh, be in trouble. Um, and part of this problem, I think also we know, is that this service burden that is keeping the university running is not shared equally. Women and faculty of color, and particularly women of color, 
do on average more service and their careers often suffer for it. I'm sure there are similar analogies with um, students and staff, but that's another discussion that were better raised by other people. I, I bring this up um, in part because the primary forces, and certainly not the only ones and not the only ones who have been contributing to anti-racism efforts on campus, but the primary drivers behind these campus conversations on race have been Keith Jones and Tony Vandermeer, two NTT faculty from Africana Studies who spent their summers really working on these issues and pushing the conversations that got us to these conversations and I think hopefully beyond. And I, I just mentioned this all of a way of thanks to Keith and Tony for all the really uncompensated work that's absolutely necessary for getting important things done. But also as, as to say that universities need to not only acknowledge, I think hard work with a, a warm thank you, but with you know ac actual compensation. And, and this is partly about equity, of course, a topic core I think to this conversation but it's also because I think initiatives such as this one, which is clearly a years long and absolutely vital process, will have trouble sustaining themselves if people simply become exhausted. Um, and I don't know all the work that Keith and Tony have done since and before George, George Floyd's murder around these issues on and off campus, but I, I have been sufficiently situated to know that it's been a colossal effort um, and that one can only be sustained with resources. And resources that fortunately the university is beginning to dedicate, I think in greater quantities, to these issues and I would just encourage that. Um, so with a final thanks to Keith and Tony, I now turn it over to Professor Jemadari Kamara. Thank you very much, Steve. I appreciate that background. I think it was very informative for all of those who have joined us this evening in our conversation. It is the crises that our community and our campus, in fact, our country has faced that has brought us to this moment. We are involved with a set of multiple crises, not only of campus conflict, not only of the contradictions in our political system, not only of COVID-19, but a complex and a very difficult situation for us all to navigate. We are confronting these, however, together and in conversation. Most recently, this past week, the Boston Globe had an article that focused on the set of contradictions that impacted the Boston Police Department. It focused on the question of structural racism within the department, as well as the issues between the department and the community. It's a complex nexus of structural issues that have impacted our community and our society for decades. I appreciate the work of so many on our campus, as Steve has referenced over this, this past um, set of months, to bring us to the point of confronting these issues very squarely. We have all heard the data, the facts, and the statistics that are of staggering proportion. But while these are necessary, they are insufficient in providing a, a background and a framework for the conversation. Because this is not about data and facts alone. It's about us. This is not just a discussion about the problem. It is what are the solutions? What are we going to do? And out of this conversation, what will be our set of actions? There are a set of restorative justice initiatives that have been put forward. And among those, the first of which was the university stating that it is an anti-racist, health-promoting institution, making a commitment to this, making a commitment to across our relative places within the institution, whether it be the administration or faculty or staff or students, to engage in a training process that allows us to speak to one another in a language we can all understand. This is a common platform. This is just an initial step, but it is the step of acknowledging that we are ill. There is an illness in this country that has infected our campus as well. And we cannot heal until we acknowledge first 
the sickness and take the steps together. We must begin to see with new eyes. We must hear and listen with open ears. This is not a top-down process. While administrative leadership is absolutely important, this is not solely a bottom-up initiative with the many groups that have come together in conversation already this, this um, semester, over the course of the summer. And those of us who will be engaged in this process, it is both simultaneously working to engage this complex set of issues. In order for our conversations to work, in order to transcend simply an illusion of inclusion, we must begin to speak to policies and actions and have a set of principles for our conversation. The first of which is that this is about policy and leading us to action, but not about personality. Secondly, that there will be a focus in our conversation with the multiplicity of issues in which we're engaged, the focus on the question of structural racism and how can addressing this help us to build a healthy and a health promoting university. And lastly, in our conversations, we must exercise discipline. Discipline of respect for one another, shared ideas, and our time. And in so doing, I'm going to uh, cut my own time, and I'd like us to begin to move to our discussion of the evening. And we will open in the spirit of Sankofa, in a con word that means literally to the way forward is to go back and to reflect that there are no errors which cannot be corrected. The reflection on the past. And in doing so, I'd like to hear the words of Miss Ella Baker, one of the unheralded leaders of the civil rights movement will share some ideas with us, and then we will have our new chancellor, Marcelo Suarez Orozco. One of the things about the question of racism that, or at least in talking to people, the question that frequently has come up recently with me is, well, we are not guilty, personally, of course you're not. I don't know that there's anybody in this room has carried on a campaign of racism per se. But I doubt that there's anybody in this room who has not at some point been guilty of supporting a racist culture. And we must search ourselves to find out how we have been guilty. Not for the sake of just wallowing in our guilt, but for the sake of facing the fact that the future of our culture, of our country, depends not so much on what black people do as it does depend on what white people do. Now, this is a hard lesson for some of us, that the choice as to whether or not we will rid the country of racism is a choice that white America has to make. I'd like to give the platform to open our conversation this evening to the Chancellor of the University of Massachusetts, Boston, Chancellor Marcelo Suarez Orozco. Thank you, Professor Camara. Thank you kindly for those wise, wise words. The choice that white America has to make. Amen. Good evening, Beacons. My name is Marcelo Suarez Orozco, and I am the Chancellor of the University of Massachusetts, Boston. I want to say thanks to so many people. I want to thank uh, Professor Camara, 
I want to thank um, Tony and Keith for their endeavors. I want to thank uh, Dean Thompson for her work and so many others for taking the lead in organizing these essential conversations. Building an anti-racist UMass Boston will take all of our endeavors. Racism, anti-blackness, xenophobia stand in complete opposition to what's humane in every culture and to the elemental, the basic requirements for the practice of democratic citizenship. Structural racism is a public health crisis. Structural racism is a public health crisis. As scholars in a public university dedicated to the practice of democratic citizenship, committed to social justice, we must reflect on our privileges and we must act in all we do against the systemic racism that impacts our community and the children and families and communities who we serve. We must address racism and anti-blackness as a crisis, as a health crisis, as a crisis that has invaded every domain of economy and society for the entire world to see. This impacts the daily lives and opportunities of individuals of color in our communities and in communities throughout the United States of America. I quote from a colleague of ours nearby, Professor Kendi, in that essential book, when he teaches us, being an anti-racist requires self-awareness, persistent self-awareness, constant self-criticism, and regular self-examination. And as Professor, uh, as our, our colleague, Professor Kamara just articulated for us, acknowledgement and facing the reality. The great James Baldwin wrote once, we cannot face, we cannot fix everything that we face, but we can't fix, let me get the exact quote here because it's too beautiful for me uh, to, to, get it, uh, to get it wrong here. Not everything that is faced can be changed. Not everything that is faced can be changed. But nothing can be changed until it is faced. That's prof our professor's, Professor Kamara's acknowledgement. Facing is a first point, is the point of departure for the long, long journey to build a more just, a more equitable, a more humane, university, city, commonwealth, and nation. As a scholar myself of migration, the great migrations of peoples who has devoted nearly 40 years to study and to understand the great movements of people of color making the journeys today within the Mariforda Global South and South to North, as well as entering huge, in huge numbers, our own country, as a scholar who has examined for almost four decades now, the global racialization of inequality and poverty in Boston, 
in LA, in New York, in the San Francisco Bay Area and elsewhere. At a time when the only sector of our population, of our child and youth population that is growing are the children of color. We face and take up the challenge to educate the most diverse cohort of young people of color in the history of our country to flourish as citizens, as workers, as public servants, as public intellectuals, and as full members of the family of the nation. I have seen despair in the eyes of refugees and forcefully displaced youngsters seeking shelter. But I have also seen hope. And I always quote the great Algerian writer, Albert Camus, who most beautifully put it, where there is no hope, we need to invent it. When racism is invading every domain of economy and society, it starts, of course, with the human body. Racism works at the molecular level. It's an epigenetic transformation that alters the brain, the heart, the hand. Education, I submit to you, is about inventing hope, nourishing dignity, and building the structures of equity for all to thrive. We must reimagine and re-engineer the narrative of belonging to the human family. We must reclaim the humanitarian call and rebuild the institutions, our institutions, as a sine qua non to move beyond what Professor Camara beautifully called the disease, the malaise of our times, structural racism hate. In the long term, we must retrain hearts and minds, especially young hearts and minds, for democracy in the context of demographic change and diversity. We need to convert the dread of the other into empathy into solidarity, into a democratizing desire for cultural difference as essential to the work of democracy in, a, in, our, in our wicked, wicked times. We must en endeavor to cultivate the humanistic ideal to find oneself in another in the people of color, in our LGBTQ com communities, in our native indigenous brothers and sisters, in the refugees, in the asylum seekers, in the forcefully displaced. That is the challenge of higher education in these troubled, troubled times. Racism as a crisis of meaning of purpose, of hurt, of the heart, of the soul. Together, together, we will take action to advance UMass Boston's advocacy and efforts in confronting structural racism and sustain, engineer a commitment to achieve excellence, equity, and engagement for all our communities. I thank you colleagues for your kind invitation. I wish you a good, healthy exchange. And I look forward to my presentation of my participation, further participation at the next 
Sankofa gathering. I want to learn more from Dr. Skeeth, Tony, from our colleagues, Professor Camara, from Dean Thompson, from all our, our, our colleagues about this existential work. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chancellor. Uh, I know you will not be able to be with us for the entire evening, but we appreciate your, your comments here and we know that you will be following our conversation both tonight and throughout the series. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, sir. I'd like to, uh, before I introduce our, our next speaker, to uh, let people know that you can submit questions through the question and answer uh, button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we will be fielding those following the initial presentations of our panelists. Our next panelist is the Provost of the University of Massachusetts, Boston, uh, Dr. Emily McDermott. Good evening, all. Um, it's always difficult to follow Chancellor Suarez Orozco, um, and I'm going to... Um, I want to start with a, a personal anecdote, actually, um, in the spirit of self-examination on the issues of structural racism. Thinking about that topic of sy systemic racism all over this summer, I, I keep remembering an, a thing that happened to me over 50 years ago when I was a young teenager in New York City. And my mother, my mother was born in Western Kentucky and came to New York to work. Uh, she met my father who was born in Dorchester, um, Massachusetts and came to New York to work. They, they settled in New York and raised their family in New York. And so I grew up as a, a liberal New Yorker basically. But one time when I was just old enough, I must have been 14 or 15, to be allowed by my parents to do some things on my own in New York City. I was in the Port Authority building in New York City, and I must have been going on a bus trip or something. I can't remember why I was there, but I was in, a, in, in New York City, and I was wearing in my ears little earrings that my Kentucky grandmother had recently sent me as a present. And they were little gold dangly earrings with Confederate flags on them. They had come from Kentucky. I didn't think much about them except I thought they were very pretty. And I thought that they attached me to my Kentucky roots, which I really knew not much about, but I was, I love my grandma. And so I was wearing these earrings as I sat in the Port Authority um, bus terminal and a black man came up to me. And at first I was a little worried because I thought, you know, you never know what a guy coming up to you in the Port Authority bus terminal is gonna say to you, um, but, I, I, I waited and he said, do you know that your earrings are a racist statement? And I went, what? I was 14, I was 15. I was very naive, young, but I was smart. And when he went on and said, you know, you are wearing a symbol of slavery and you should be ashamed of yourself for that. And I, I was kind of floored by the whole thing, but I immediately saw that he was right. And I was embarrassed by my earrings at that point. I think I mumbled something about my grandmother. I don't remember anything more about the incident. But I took the earrings off. And when I went home, I thought, well, I had thought of these earrings as linking me to my Kentucky grandmother, my Kentucky aunt, people that I loved dearly, but only saw very rarely. But now that I had been made aware of how they were perceived by somebody else, 
and how hurtfully they could be experienced by somebody else, they, they weren't ever gonna be the same to me again. Sadly, I put them back in their little gold box with cotton in it, closed the box and never took them out again. And for me, that was a moment at which I really first noticed the things I did with no intention to be hurtful, certainly no intention to be racist, could be viewed as racist by others. And it, it was a, a stunning kind of revelation to me, and I thank that man for coming up to me at a very formative time in my upbringing to bring that to my attention. Over the next decade, this was in the 60s, over the next decade, I went through being shattered by the assassination of John F. Kennedy and then Robert F. Kennedy and then Martin Luther King. I protested, I went to Washington. Um, I marched on Washington twice. I fasted against Vietnam. I protested against the uh, Bobby Seal trial in New Haven. I, I was very alert at that point to various issues, but even as I've kept those liberal sorts of political ideologies, I've been aware frequently over my life that there are moments when you just don't know what impression you're giving to someone of a different race. That you might say something that you mean one way and it's totally carelessly thought through by you, but you, it can be taken some other total way by another person or another group of people. And I think that's the kind of perception that a university absolutely needs to be giving to all students who come into it at a formative age. And a formative age could be 28. I mean, I'm not saying everybody's gonna come in at 18 to the university, but everyone who comes into a university comes into it in a large sense to be formed. They may think they're coming to get a better job, they may think they're coming for a basic union card that's going to help them get, get a better um, leg up in life. But from our point of view as educators, they're coming to be formed and we want to form them in a way that makes them notice. Makes them notice if they are themselves being structurally racist, if they see others doing things that are structurally racist, and how to, how to look at society and figure out how to create or invent, as, Chancellor, um, as the Chancellor said, to invent that hope that we all need um, to have right now in order to continue on and continue with our mission to educate our students and to provide for a more socially just society in general. I think I'll stop there at this point. Thank you very much, Provost McDermott, for those thoughtful comments. I'd like to uh, turn to a guest panelist professor in anthropology, who has a long history at UMass of involvement uh, and critical thought around the issues of structural racism. I'd like to introduce Dr. Tim Sieber. Thank you. Um, this is my 47th year at UMass and We've never had this conversation before in such a public, open way. I feel glad and privileged 
to be here for this. For too long, too many of us, knowing and celebrating that we were more diverse than other schools, especially in student body, but also in faculty and staff, wrongly took our simple demographic features as proof enough that we were attending to racial inclusion and equity. People would say, um, how can you question the racial climate here? Just look around. What do you see? Aren't we doing a good job? What's there to talk about? So many didn't seem to realize that to build our own beloved community here on Columbia Point uh, requires confronting and talking more about racism, such as we're doing today. It was curious we claimed credit for an inexorable demographic change in a school that was simply accessible to the public around us. We just lowered the gates more than any other local school. From the beginning, we championed this idea of access. So simply by existing, we were good. Unlike UMass Amherst, we never even actually had any kind of affirmative action program for student admissions because we didn't need one. Dr. Mildred Garcia, now president of the American Association of State Colleges and Universities, who incidentally was so intrigued by us that she twice applied long ago as a candidate for our provost and chancellor's positions, has written and spoken a great deal about higher education's multiple levels of racial inclusion. The simplest, lowest level, she said, is having the presence of more diverse people. Depending on population changes, it can even happen without your making any effort to produce it. But she argued, this is only the first step anyway in becoming truly inclusive. The second is developing programs and supports that meet the needs of different groups, especially newcomers, and promote their success as students, staff, and faculty. We've made some progress on that, but we still have a long way to go. Third and most effective in terms of the university's evolution toward institutionalizing a truly racially inclusive culture, she argued, is power sharing. Only if the authority of newly arrived diverse groups is respected and given a place in fundamental policy dialogues and decision making and being allowed to guide necessary change can real equity and inclusion take place. Maybe we're starting to get there now. Garcia's ideas are very much in keeping also with someone else who's been mentioned a lot tonight already several times, Ibram X. Kendi. His own recent argument that genuine anti-racism requires a more democratic sharing of power across racial groups and shifts not just in consciousness and values, but in policy and practice. Today, we're fortunate so many groups on our campus have been putting their minds together to define how UMB can become more truly anti-racist. And all their recommendations go well beyond the symbolic and the performative, identifying real concrete policy changes that will make a difference. The Africana Studies Department, for example, has long been advocating the 16-point restorative justice initiative and it offers solid, relevant guidance. The cipher of the graduate program in leadership in education at the College of Education and Human Development also proposes a concrete 23-point program of policy changes and administrative actions to move toward an anti-racist campus. Other groups with ideas and ready to collaborate include the multi-spoke Undoing Racism Assembly formed by Africana Studies together with the campus unions, the Academic Continuity Task Force, Kanala, the Faculty Council, the Black Faculty and Staff Caucus, the Latino Coalition, the Faculty of Color Group, and the UMB Student Coalition. We're well poised and prepared to join together to take action. Of course, we need to become anti-racist, not only internally for ourselves, the 20,000 UMB community members when you count both students and employees together, but also so that we can play a leadership role in our city and region. Chancellor Suarez Orozco recently stood up for our campus in this way in multiple media appearances 
that have happened recently. We also appreciate Provost McDermott's support for our effort. And we also know that the new provost who will follow her needs to be a strong partner in this effort. We all need to step up to this leadership role because we're truly a community engaged university with literally thousands of partnerships with nonprofit organizations, associations, and governmental entities, and a rich set of more than 50 policy institutes and centers that offer valuable research and consultation to those partners. And of course, there are our students. They too come from the city around us. As a public urban university, we need to realize that the public, our students, and our neighbors are one and the same. This gives us a special multifaceted responsibility toward them that private universities do not have. The students who we prepare here are already there in their communities around us, already growing in their leadership, hopefully also anti-racist with the help of models they see reinforced here at UMass Boston. So we have a big responsibility for ourselves, but also for others. Once before, between 1979 and 1982, UMass Boston joined and actively participated in a broad citywide coalition on behalf of racial justice. It was called the Covenant of Justice, Equity, and Harmony, together with hundreds of universities, faith communities, and nonprofits, all to support Boston's school desegregation order. We can and should play this kind of courageous, anti-racist public role again. This unique historical juncture in the pandemic remind us that our opening, our time to tell the truth, to focus our vision and to act, doesn't last forever. Now is the time for listening to one another, for agreeing upon and taking needed steps, and for meeting the challenges and opportunities of this special historical moment we are all living through. Here at UMass Boston, we have the people, the will, and the vision to make it happen. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Sieber. Your comments and reflections on issues that have arisen in the past and the leadership role of our institution in them is very insightful. I'm sure we will come back to that in the, the question period. Uh, I'd like to ask our, our panelists as well, uh, when you have your mics on to be very careful so that uh, any papers or other sounds in your background uh, do not get picked up as we move forward. Professor Sieber mentioned um, some of the activity that has gone on under the leadership of our next uh, presenter. Uh, it was uh, the chair of the Department of Leadership in Education, uh, Dr. Tara Parker. I'd like you to, uh, to speak to some of those issues that uh, Tim raised. All right. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Uh, thank you for uh, having me. And thank you for everyone being here and being part of this incredibly important uh, conversation. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the cipher, um, but I also want to talk about some things that are uh, more personal to me. Um, in other meetings and other events on campus, some of you may have heard me talk about some of these issues that are important to me specifically as a black woman, as a faculty member, and as a department chair. Specifically um, at UMass Boston, black women faculty uh, generally have higher service and advising loads. Uh, Dr. Striffler actually commented on that, uh, and we have some new data on that. Um, most of us who do have tenure uh, have also served as department chair at some point. I'm currently in my uh, fifth year as department chair, and we've done this as associate professors. Uh, in fact, at UMass Boston, we have very few black women full professors, and those uh, who are full came into the institution with it, meaning they were hired uh, as full professors. Uh, to date, there's still only one black woman on our campus who went through tenure and promotion to full professor 
on our campus. So uh, we need to increase recruitment and retention of faculty of color. Uh, when we hire them, we need to look at uh, discrepancies in terms of uh, course load reductions that they come in with. Um, I've also seen uh, faculty of color, in particular women faculty of color, come up, come in with a lower startup funds. We need to improve our support and mentorship for women faculty of color so that uh, we can retain them and also so that uh, they can um, be promoted. So uh, I've been here at UMass Boston for 15 years. I'm actually now in my 16th year. Um, and for most of my time here, uh, despite our urban mission, I didn't ever really expect to hear much response to some of the racial issues that I observed uh, in a variety of settings. Uh, even though we have this urban mission and even though we have such a large uh, population of students of color, in a lot of ways, we're still a predominantly white institution in terms of our operation. Um, so again, I, I, I wasn't really uh, surprised when I would be in meetings, uh, particularly uh, in terms of uh, search committee meetings, when former staff from our own Office of Diversity and Inclusion emphasized to all the uh, participants in the meeting that it was more important to consider a diversity of thought rather than uh, diversity in terms of race and ethnicity. Or the time when I first started as department chair and a former faculty member, he, he's no longer here, but when I said that we were going to emphasize in our department um, increasing the racial and ethnic diversity of our faculty, uh, he, he pushed back on me and said that uh, white men were underrepresented. And then there are times when uh, I was on search committees and I heard lots of talk about uh, lack of fit or the difficulty of getting faculty of color here because you know Boston has this history of racism so people of color don't really want to come here and it's so expensive and blah 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 um, and then there were times when we settled for a pool of candidates that was not racially and ethnically diverse and we said oh we just couldn't get them to apply but then we didn't look at our own recruitment efforts. Did we actually go out to find them? Because <laughs> um, a lot of times we like to say, oh, there's just not enough PhD, people of color, PhDs in this field. But we're not out there looking. They are there, but we're not actually going out. And we have to hit the ground and actually uh, do the work. And so here we are at this moment, in this movement for racial justice, and on our campus, I'm happy to see there's so much discussion about race and racism. And nearly everyone I've spoken to, everyone I've heard from, because I get a lot of emails, uh, in every meeting that I've attended, I've, I've felt like there's really a lot of support for these conversations. Most of us agree that we should pay more attention to the need to be an anti-racist institution. But my concern is, how committed are we to really getting down and dirty to identify the racism that exists on our campus? Are we really interested in learning about the ways that whiteness is deeply ingrained in the academy as a whole and specifically at UMass Boston? Again, despite our urban mission and despite the fact that uh, we are one of the most diverse institutions in New England. And as academics, faculty, we're really good at intellectualizing things. And so I've seen us do that in these conversations around racism. We understand what racism is intellectually, but we don't necessarily understand, or maybe we don't want to understand, how it actually manifests or the impact on people psychologically, emotionally, behaviorally, physiologically. Some of our uh, white faculty, completely miss the pain that people of color experience when we're told to consider waiting a year or two before going up for full professor. You might not be ready right now. Or be careful publishing in those journals that are specific to race and ethnicity because you might not get tenure. Or when our experiences and contributions are overlooked and undervalued in department meetings or committee meetings. 
And you can see this in terms of our students too. You can see it in the way we talk about students we're going to admit, in the way we assess them, our writing proficiency exam, in the development of dissertations, right? And we see it when we're working with students of color in particular, in particular the messages we send to them. And at the same time, we as black people and as people of color, we also don't show our pain. So we smile much like Kamala Harris did in the vice presidential debate. We smile in our interviews. We smile in our faculty meetings and committee meetings because we're concerned about being labeled too sensitive or worse, too angry. And then we have to call up our brothers and sisters <laughs> And we have to lean on them and rely on them to just get us through, just to survive this academy. And sometimes those networks are on our campus. Most of the time they're off our campus because there's just not enough of us. Um, and then there's some folks, I know this because I speak to them, that just feel alone, that they have no one to talk to. So for me, I hear us talk a lot about training and training is needed. Training is needed for some. But I got to be honest with you, <laughs> uh, as a black woman, as a black woman faculty member who studies race and who's experienced racism uh, since, I, I won't say my age, but you know, I've been around for a while <laughs> and I've, I've experienced it throughout my life. Um, so I, I don't feel like I need training, but some of our uh, colleagues and most of our administrators may need training. Um, but from my perspective, most of my black and brown sisters and brothers don't need the training. We need healing. We need restoration. And we need reconciliation. And so uh, Chancellor Suarez Orozco has talked about a racial justice commission. Uh, I'm happy about that. I'm optimistic about that. But if we're really going to push this uh, forward, then that, from my perspective, that commission has to act more as a truth and reconciliation commission to move us towards real transformation. To be an actively anti-racist institution, not just a leading uh, anti-racist institution, we have to include everyone. We have to include all of our programs, all of our departments, all of our units, from academic affairs to student affairs, from finance and administration to university advancement. advancement. And then we also have to think about the ways we engage with our larger community right? Because uh, we are on Columbia Point. Sometimes we like to think that we, <laughs> we, we just on the harbor, but uh, we are in Columbia Point. We are in Dorchester, right? Our address, when you look at it, says Boston, but we are specifically in Dorchester, and that's an important uh, point to make. Uh, sorry, I'm getting, I'm getting fired up here. <laughs> yes, you are. Yes, you are, Professor <laughs> <Special> Parker. <laughs> I'm looking, I just, I'm looking for will, real yep. action. I want we, action. We hear that, I want transformation. We hear that very clearly. And in fact, All right. your uh, focus on this question of, of truth and reconciliation, as you began to bring that truth, I, a lot of heads were nodding uh, across the screen. I saw that. Uh, and before we can get to reconciliation, we have to deal with truth. We have right to on. deal with the pain that you talked about. Uh, and I'm sure we will come back to some of those issues that you raised up because out of that truth and reconciliation process has to come repair. And how do we get to that repair? We don't deal with the healing of the pain that you spoke of. Thank you very much for your comments. All right, thank you. Uh, you also, however, spoke about the breadth of uh, those who've been involved even up to this point in our conversation as um, uh, Steve did in our introduction. And I'd like to bring forward uh, Janelle Quarles, who is the president of our Classified and Staff Union. Hello, good evening all. Um, I am very happy to be part of uh, these conversations tonight. Um, I do represent about 300 staff, uh, classified staff, meaning uh, your admin assistants, your trades, security officers, most of the frontline staff um, across the campus and some at the president's office as well. Um, and I, you know, listening to the other panelists 
talk about some of their things. I, I, I think about um, my personal journey as well as a black woman working at this public university that is absolutely centered in the middle of Dorchester. Um, as many know, my, my mother worked at the university. She was actually a student at Boston State University and a student worker there. And when the uh, two institutions, Boston State and UMass Boston merged, she came over with the merger and worked for more than 40 years um, with the Division of Continuing Education, which you know has different name changes over the years, CAPS and CCDE. Um, but she was there and I recall a story she told me when she was a student at Boston State and her big thing was going into uh, criminal justice. And that was one of the things that she wanted to, to study and eventually become a law enforcement officer. However, being a young black woman coming into a very white male dominated uh, major um, and also a profession, she was really not welcomed. She was in classes and, you know, was rarely um, considered. Uh, didn't feel like she was being included, different lectures. And so she eventually changed her major to English and settled with that. Um, and then for years, I would hear her come home or have, when she'd come home and tell me stories or share stories of different struggles where she had to stand up for herself and really had to, um, you know, become a bit aggressive and, and because if not, her superiors or some, even some of her coworkers would be very nasty to her um, for one reason or another. Um, and she just did not want to shrink into a corner. And I would listen to these stories and think, oh, that, that, you know, they're terrible and, you know, that's not going to happen to me. And of course, as a student at UMass Boston, I definitely experienced, experienced some racial, some, some, some racial exchanges. Um, and I was stick, I stuck to it as a student and I made sure that I stood up for myself. And then even a decade later, becoming a staff member at UMass Boston, I experienced the same thing as a staff with the superiors. And I felt I had to stand up for myself and push back and be looked on as, as aggressive. Um, and you know, that, uh, you know, quote unquote aggression led me to be more of a, a labor activist and, and, and seek um, office in order to help my fellow staff members uh, push back on certain things like uh, bull, bully, bullies and um, systemic racism which is alive and well at UMass Boston. And it's really unfortunate because my naivete always thought a university is, you know, an institution where you can have a free exchange of ideas and sort of learn more about yourself, learn the real history of things, was a way of, of getting academic and, you know, freedom. So when that, when you come to a, a public university and you're stopped and experience a lot of the um, same things that you receive either on the outside or in, when you were in uh, grade school or you hear all the old older relatives tell you the stories and you experience the same things, it's very, it's very, uh, it, it, you, it, you wonder why you wanna keep going. It can make you feel like you don't need to keep going anymore and why would you? And it, can, it also brings you down, which is why tonight, being a, representing the staff at UMass Boston is something that we need to also consider when we talk about promoting a healthy campus and systemic racism. A lot of the frontline workers are people of color, different backgrounds, a lot of them are women, you know, uh, you know, raising children. They come here, they either want a second career or they want to continue their education or pursue their education and they want their children to do the same. And it's very um, unfortunate that some of them are leaving because they don't have the support 
that they have from either the administration or some of their coworkers or their department heads. And it's, um, it's, it's unfortunate that we're here in the middle of an urban, of an urban setting and the university touts an urban mission, but they certainly don't, they certainly don't live up to it. And as a staff member, I think that I am, I feel like sometimes an outlier in that when I am doing my job and I'm doing my union work, um, that it, I wonder why with so much animosity and sometimes I have to push back at work, both in my regular job and on the union side, what makes me keep going? And I have to remember that my mother, these stories that she told me, and in spite of all that, she kept going. And I don't know how many of my, of my fellow staff workers, especially people of color, have these things to look back on and have these things to, to keep them fighting where they should not have to fight so hard. The fight is real outside of the university and around the country. And the fact that we look at the news and still get out of bed and keep going is one feat in and of itself. But then to come to a place like UMass Boston, which promises what looks like on the outside could give us so much hope and take us so far and we should be as we call ourselves beacons, <laughs> we should be true beacons <laughs> leading the charge on promoting diversity, fairness, you know, social awareness and, you know, and, and being this front runner and sort of looking at the other institutions, be they public or private and say, what is going on with you? Come join us. It's really unfortunate that we're behind. And, you know, how do we begin to, to change this? And, uh, you know, we also as staff have to deal with the fact that we're looked at as expendable. A lot of the, the higher up, the, which we, like the faculty, you know, when, when we're not the ones bringing in the research, bringing in the dollars, you know, it's, we're really looked at as, hey, you know, you, you should be here, you should be happy to have a job and you should keep your head low and keep going, which is really inhumane when you think of it, but that is what a lot of our staff members hear. And when you think about the people of, of, of color who work here, who go to school here and got their degrees here, many of our CSU staff have advanced degrees and want to continue their learning and, and look at UMass Boston for those, for those um, degrees. And they're still not looked at as part of this university, as people who actually give their lifeblood to this university and contribute. You know, we, we, we may not be the ones bringing in all the research and all the research dollars, but we certainly interact with the students that come through day in and day out. We, we make connections with them that keep them here. We have students who come from all over the world. So then when the holidays come around, they're not able to go home and be with their families. We take them in to be with our families. So we absolutely make a contribution Yet we have the struggle of one being frontline workers who on some level seem that we, we don't matter and it does, you know, who cares who we are? We don't really have these personal connections with upper administration like the provost or the chancellor, not on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and people who, you know, still experience racial attacks from their supervisors. And when they go to their human resources person, to their support people that are supposed to be there to support them, they don't see any results. They don't, they don't see any support there as well. And I don't say that to mean that people are being intentional in how they re react to these things or how they approach, but systemic racism is put into, is, it's, it's, it's built in. And so your reaction is sort of something that has been put into you a long time ago. And I don't even know that you're aware that you're reacting this way. 
And that goes for everyone, not just, not just the people with the authority, co-workers, everyone who has gone through systemic type of, of either racism, systemic bullying, all of these things play in to what we're talking about tonight. And I have just, you know, I made it my lifetime goal to keep pushing back on this and keep having these conversations for as long as needed and these actions because we need to have action as well. I am committed to making sure that this university lives up to what it tells is that it's set in an urban setting and it has an urban mission and it's going to serve the community and the public. Thank you very much, Janelle. You've raised up some critical issues and, and contradictions, the questions of hierarchy uh, within our institution, the animosity that is felt, uh, and some of the triggers uh, that impact uh, staff across the institution. And I'm sure we will hear more about that in our, our question and discussion period. Right. I'd like to um, introduce at this time uh, the director of our Center for Innovative Teaching and Associate Press Professor in uh, Urban Education, Dr. Patricia kruger Henny. Thank you so much, Dr. Kumara. I am Patricia kruger Henny. I'm a Black Dominican woman who has uh, taught at UMass Boston um, for the last eight complete years. This is my ninth year. And I would like to think through with all of you through some of the teaching and learning practices of what anti-racism and health promoting work could look like. So I, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to connecting with all of you for the next few minutes about this and then later on in our um, conversation, our discussion. So thanks so much for inviting me, for having me part of tonight's urgent event. I'd like to just uh, open by quoting some of James Baldwin's work, because I really think it situates uh, poignantly uh, the intention of this conversation. I quote, if you're a Negro dealing with people all day, all year long, all lifelong, who never look at you, then you have to figure out one day what they are looking at. Obviously, it isn't you. So, what is UMass Boston looking at? Who is UMass Boston looking at at this very moment? And I also ask, why is UMass Boston now looking at wanting to lead and be known for doing anti-racist and health promoting work? What it has meant for me for the past 28 years as a community organizer, as a faculty member of various teacher ed programs for a, you know, as a youth advocate and community organizer, et cetera, et cetera, is that the classrooms that I welcome and build co-create with students, they become construction sites. In fact, I don't, I don't really focus on building guidelines that prioritize safety, meaning emotional safety or physical safety, although I need to be careful with what I mean by that. During our classroom time, our in-person contact on campus at UMass Boston, we excavate together processes of racist and otherwise oppressive systems. We excavate them, we name them, we trace them, trace how they work, how they function, how they operate. We dismantle them. And if we can do that, I argue always through pedagogy especially, that we can rebuild them, make them anew. And it really focuses on this sort of, this approach really focus on that racism and other forms of horribly violent systems of oppression and subordination are human made, right? So if we can dismantle them, we can completely construct anew. So in other words, anti-racist and health promoting work for me has been really about liberation, not just individual, but our collective liberation. And it is also about liberating each other. So I do this work ongoingly with students at UMass Boston, but also with wonderful colleagues through the Center for Innovative Teaching at UMass Boston. And so I wish right now to share with you um, a moment of perhaps 
uh, a moment of, of this anti-racist and health promoting work, what does it look like in action? Um, I'd like to share that with you. And if we were together in person, I could show you a map of this work or how this work, work has been mapped. So what I do, I will do instead is I will read a description and perhaps you can, maybe you need to close your eyes, but I just welcome you to be open to these words of students. And I situate this work of body mapping um, in circumstances how white supremacy, anti-blackness, and anti-black racism is really a disease, is one that causes ongoing public health crises among targeted bodies. So under these ongoing and chronic conditions of the disease, young people have written, students have written that in sickness, I'm starting to read now, the forehead is tagged with pressure and stress, while two large teardrops are flowing from one eye, with three ribs running on either side of the rib cage. This black woman attached one of the following labels to each one, drama, insecurity, trapped, fear, denial, and anger. Her heart is small and carries tiny letters that spell hope. Her spine holds her to be hopeless. The left arm is marked with upset and betrayed, while the right arm is tattooed with weakness and lost. The hands meet in front of her and hold a book that she crossed out. Her waistline is tightened by mistrust. Her left thigh reads scarred and the right thigh scared. Her toes point to the side bringing her ankles together. They are chained together and an arrow points at their bondage. We also visualize what practices, what knowledges trigger our liberation, but more important, our cure, our practices of healing um, remedies, right? So a cured body, the same young woman, a cured body, one that is freed from anti-blackness, racism, in education could look like this. Again, I read from her narrative, from her map. We regularly, sorry, in its cured state, freedom runs across her forehead. Her now smiling face does not make way for any tears. Both arms are raised, one signaling hope, the other success. The heart is now visibly larger and filled with hope. Four ribs compose messages of secure, strong, truth, heal. Voice holds her waistline wide while guidance and action run across her thighs. Her ankles are no longer linked together in bondage. And she recommends us to speak up, to be heard, to transfer, to make a group and educate self and others. I will close now with just a few words of wisdom that UMass Boston students have taught me and that I have to incorporate in my ongoing anti-racism health promoting teaching practices while at UMass Boston. Number one, that this work, that this commitment is not performative, but rather it needs to be authentic. Two, we need to question deeply the following, in what ways is the sudden urge to become an anti-racist and health-promoting university potentially productive for the next phases of racial capitalist development? Or in what ways does this institution-wide call to anti-racist action duplicate what liberal multiculturalism has accomplished in the 1980s, meaning that the desire to grow into more diversified campuses, a campus was absorbed by hegemonic university policies and practices. Three, I courageously ask, what if UMass Boston's anti-racist and health-promoting practices and knowledges inhabit institutional spaces in ways that UMass Boston never intended? So lastly, I also look at tonight as an opportunity to ask the following. What is UMass Boston willing to give up so that minoritized differences and knowledges can thrive without becoming the function of a racial neoliberalism, of racial neoliberalism in public higher education? And I'll leave it at that. 
thanks so much. And I really look forward to our next speaker who we need to listen to really carefully. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Kruger Henning. Uh, you have raised some issues. In fact, your students have raised questions that need to be addressed as we open our conversation. We have two more speakers. Uh, and then we will engage in that conversation. We have questions that are already coming in that we want to put on the table, but you have raised several issues, particularly this question about what bodies of knowledge trigger liberation. The, the questions your students are raising are challenges to all of us. Our, our next speaker is in fact a, an undergraduate student at UMass, and I would like her to speak for herself. Ms. Celine Wayar. Hello. Um, I, yeah, my name is Celine. I go by she, they pronouns. And I am a junior majoring in labor studies and a member of um, the UMB coalition, um, student coalition. Um, and so something that I would just like to say, you know, I would hope for in future cases, there'll be more student voices um, but something that I just wanted to say in terms of what my hopes are and expectations are when I have, when I'm entering into or getting an education um, is one that I would be able to be supported um, academically, uh, socially, um, emotionally, and even financially to function in society when I graduate. And that second, that my education would be able to equip me uh, with tools needed to change society for the better. And so as our current rea reality sits um, with the BLM movement, um, ringing the alarm to reopen um, and re-emerge the types of struggle um, since the civil rights movement and even decades before then, uh, the type of struggle that is rooted in seeking freedom, Black liberation, and at most to legitimize uh, the humanity um, of Black lives, that can't be done um, in the current state that UMass Boston is in. Um, but more than anything, I think, and let me preface, when I say Black liberation, uh, that in extension, when the Black person is free, when all Black people are free, that in extension um, frees anyone who's a part of the BIPOC community, the LGBTQ plus community, those of the working class, um, uh, immigrant communities, women, and so on and so forth. Um, and so, you know, I, I really do look forward to, I want the conversation, the discussion part to start. Um, so I really do look forward to talking about the many ways that we can have an anti-racist and health promoting campus. Um, and yeah, yeah, I really look forward to having the conversation. I'm going to cut myself short. Uh, but yes, thank you. Thank you for letting me uh, participate in this. Thank you, Celine. We want your comments as we lift up our dialogue and discussion. Uh, session in response to the questions. We certainly want to hear your voice in response to the issues that are being raised. Our final presenter is the Dean of our College of Nursing, uh, who is very distinguished in her own right, Dr. Linda Thompson. Well, good evening and thanks for asking me to be a part of this uh, dialogue to talk about the concept of promoting health promoting uh, universities and Celine it's just so wonderful that you're here and I just really cherish the fact that you had the courage to come in and be with us this evening and to share your perspective. Our, uh, our country right now is facing uh, this dual epidemic of racism and health illustrated by COVID-19 and the police shootings of unarmed black Black Americans. So racism, both individual and structural, is, is deeply, deeply ingrained 
in the social, political, and economic fabric of our society. With adverse outcomes to individuals and communities of color for African Americans, Native Americans, Latina, Latinx, Asian Pacific Islanders, and other communities of color, this results in unequal access to social and economic opportunities such as quality education, a livable wage and employment, healthy food and stable and affordable housing and safe and sustainable communities. Public health professionals view these as upstream problems that lead to systemic racism and we see it as a public health crisis that uh, inhibits a person's ability to be healthy and prosper. The, ever, you know, the everyday trauma of racism takes a toll on the mental well-being, which is directly linked to health and wellness. And so meaningful solutions to systemic racism and structural inequalities require all of us to engage with and invest in, and invest in disenfranchised communities to enact policies and programs that reverse historical injustices, and to build systems that provide everyone a fair and just opportunity to be economically and socially healthy. This allows them to thrive in places where they work, where they live, where they play, and where they worship. At UMass Boston, we're proposing that we commit to becoming a health-promoting and anti-racist public university. The World Health Organization defines health promotion as the process of enabling people to, in to increase control over and to improve their health. Health promotion recognizes that health is created and lived by people within their everyday life. Health is therefore viewed holistically reflecting physical, mental, economic, and social well-being, and not merely an absence of disease. And so from this perspective, health promotion is no longer the sole responsibility of the health sector. Rather, all sectors of society must be engaged to take a stance in favor of health inequity, to take a stance for social and racial justice, to take a stance for economic security for everyone. So because institutions of higher learning play a, cru a crucial role in all aspects of development of individuals, of communities, of societies, and culture, they have a responsibility to provide transformational education to engage the student voice to develop new knowledge and ways of understanding and to advocate for more progressive and just policies that benefit society and all of its members. So administrators, faculty and staff at UMass Boston, they must understand that health and wellness involves the capacity of individuals to reach their full potential, that capacity and potential historically has been compromised by racism, especially anti-Black racism. This historical systems of, opp of oppression causes immense mental and physical stress. And we have problems accessing health care. And what we've done is separated communities from their historical and cultural ancestral healing traditions that were, um, you know, that you see in the, in the diasporas. Our framework for health promotion and, and anti-racism is in grounded in the belief that Black lives matter and that Black lives and communities deserve access to affirming and culturally appropriate health promoting practices, policies, and systems. So as this, at, at our institution, we want uh, UMass Boston, Boston to commit to a holistic view of health that sees historical structures of, of oppression and domination as, uh, as racism. And we need to solve some of these his, historical inequalities 
they're urgent, and there's a dire need to promote the health and well being of all of our faculty, our staff, and our students. So, what we're proposing in this, this strategy is to embed health and wellness in all policies, all of our academic programs, and in our engagement with communities, to create a culture on our campus that's caring and compassionate, to optimize positive outcomes and personal development for students, faculty, and staff, to contribute to transdisciplinary curriculum that advances the quality of life for vulnerable populations, to build and support effective relationships and collaborations on and off campus, to have transformational teaching and learning environments that inspire students and faculty, to, to value the local community context through informed understanding of population-based approaches to priority setting, to look at advancing multidisciplinary and transdisciplinary research that's relevant to real-world outcomes, to advance the promotion of environmental sustainability and human well-being, to co-create a vision for our campus using a participatory approach involving all stakeholders, and to focus on everyone's strengths and their assets to fully develop people. You know, I believe that we should support the right to health for everyone. This is enshrined in the UN Declaration of Human Rights that talks about social justice, equity, dignity, and respect for everyone. So just in closing, I want to quote the, the late Congressman John Lewis, who wrote, when historians pick up their pens to write the story of the 21st century, let them say that it was your generation who laid down the heavy burden of hate and that peace finally trump, trump, triumphed over violence, aggression, and war. So I say to you, walk with the wind, brothers and sisters, and let the spirit of peace and power of, of, of everlasting love be your guide. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dean Thompson. You have raised some critical issues. Some of the threads that came up earlier in our conversation regarding the importance of the transdisciplinary and multidisciplinary work. The chancellor, in fact, began talking about this need for a cultural change in our institution. What is the nature of that change that we must address? And what are the role of all of those stakeholders, our alumni, our community in which we sit in co-creating with us the nature of that change? You've raised some critical issues. Thank you so much for your remarks. We've received a number of questions. Uh, and I'd like us to, to move quickly to them, uh, being cognizant of uh, our time and uh, that which remains for us to really engage with those who are listening with us. To do so, I would like to um, put together a couple of questions and then allow you to respond. So if you take some notes, I'll read the questions to you and then allow our, our panelists to uh, discuss uh, your responses to these. We have one question that says, education is not the great equalizer as for many reasons, but critical to this are the ways in which education continues to reproduce racist ideology and false narratives about communities. How is UMB decolonizing curricula and reassessing faculty, um, narr faculty narratives about communities. How is UMB not only reassessing the curricula, but assessing the faculty to support an anti-racist environment? A similar question that has followed is, are there efforts to understand and address internal, internalized oppression at UMB. I'd like you to respond to those. 
who would like to respond? Hello. Okay, so then? Um, something in terms of uh, how is UMB decolonizing curriculum? I think that that is something that needs to be done. I know some certain professors are trying to, you know, instill a transformative form of education, but given the state that UMass Boston is in, there is a lot uh, that needs to be, you know, worked on. I think the opening of hearing Ella Baker uh, talk about um, white responsibility and racism and also hearing uh, Parker speak on this need for healing and reconciliation, but also delving into the truth of the matter. Um, and that is understanding that, uh, you know, power is relational, that there cannot be power, um, that one, someone cannot have power um, without there being some sort of a force, um, some sort of a force controlling or overcoming another. Um, and so understanding that white supremacy is, you know, embedded within the individual, as well as within the institutions, higher education being one of them, um, ha it gives us the time today to now reflect on how education should be changed and, and how UMass Boston, uh, being that it is an urban institution, uh, being that it does have an urban mission, that it should follow that. Um, and I think over the years and in knowing and understanding UMass Boston's history that has been ignored and neglected um, and that in order for UMass Boston to actually become an anti-racist one um, and in order for its curriculum to reflect an anti-racist sentiment, uh, that there needs to be a way in which UMass Boston works with the community there needs to be a way in which our research reflects that of the community. And there needs to be a way in which faculty and administration um, that are in favor of saying that they believe in uh, an anti-racist, um, in, uh, in, in believe in, 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 in stating an anti-racist uh, campus um, need to show it. Um, I think that in the same way that white privilege, it's not enough to acknowledge it, but it's how you use it uh, that makes the difference. And so that can come through, uh, that can come through working with community organizations that already exist that are pushing for many of the issues that not only Boston is facing, but our students are facing along with them. So if there was a, in order for the decolonizing of the curriculum to happen, uh, there needs to be a way in which um, in which professors who who are use who create uh, research that work with the community that it is reflected also in the classroom that are that the students um, who maybe because of the way that education has um, completely disrupted our form of identity, our form of autonomy, uh, that that needs to be re-emerged um, through uh, faculty teachings. Um, and uh, yeah, okay. And that is, that is what I'm gonna say about that. Okay, thank you. Um, Patricia. I'd like to keep thinking with Celine about the decolonizing curriculum work. So every college has a curriculum committee and this committee of faculty members uh, reviews, discusses, especially newly proposed courses to enter our university-wide course catalog. And I think it's, the work needs to go beyond looking for the required components. We need to look beyond what a syllabus, an approved syllabus, needs to look like. And I say this because I've sat on this committee for the College of Education, my college, and it's not critical enough. It doesn't go in depth. So the problem is, if, is also if you include, let's say, the scholarship perspectives, knowledges of BIPOC scholars, but you have 
white people, let's say, teach these courses, it becomes another effort of culture vulture appropriation without the instructor having any kind of relationship to the perspectives that she, they, he wishes to teach, right? No relationship, no reflexivity often is also involved in this. So I really do think that decolonizing the individual curriculum, our syllabi, it really, so especially at the curriculum committee level of each of our colleges, we need to really think about what knowledges do we want to share, discuss with our students and for what purposes, what's the intentionality, what's the end game of changing any curricular perspectives, right? And um, I, hence I suggest our curriculum committees at each college, we need to go through some kind of training with clear examples. Um, there are many of us who have been doing this work, know how to do this work, and we really need to lean on each other's expertise so that we do not perpetuate and thus ossify ongoing, let's say, white Eurocentric perspectives of knowledge pr production, right? That we do not harden these and make them permanent. Thank you. Uh, Dean Thompson. You know, one of the ways I think we could do this is, is, is really around a visioning uh, process for the campus where we agree on some common threads that we incorporate in every discipline on our campus. So it's not individualized types of, of curriculum per on, uh, within each department or within each college. And I'll just give you an example. When I worked at at at, um, at Hampton, we uh, there are there's content that every student who graduates from that from that university they they're, they're required to take. They're required to take a course that focuses on their African on African uh, history, African American history. They are required to learn in their humanities course about the scholars and the, the, the arts uh, that have been uh, developed uh, by people of color. So I think it, it really is a commitment when I talked about co-creating and, and, and this participatory strategy, getting people to come together with a common vision of the type of person that we want to develop and when they leave our campus, there's certain content that everyone has and you know clearly that they graduated from our campus. We have to agree on that and require that that's embedded in our curriculum and that's how you, you're able to do it. But it's not a one-off thing. You have to really have that kind of vision and that commitment. Excellent point. Professor Sieber, uh, your mic is, there you go. Just very quickly, I, I, um, to answer the question, one of the questions you, you, um, you told us about, um, there are some places on campus where people are seriously um, excavating this whole issue of decolonization of knowledge of the curriculum of theory of research and um, one is in the Native American and Indig in Indigenous Studies program that's headed up right now by Maria John in history. And it's in mostly in the College of Liberal Arts, but um, it's a serious project of that uh, program. And also the um, School for uh, Global Inclusion and Social Development. Um, there's a lot of work happening there now, and it's, and it's, um, it's mostly people of color who are who are doing this, who have the kind of um, embeddedness of experience that uh, Patricia was talking about earlier. That uh, for whom this uh, is more than an intellectual project, it's uh, something that they um, they feel is very central to their identity and their connection with um, the world and the communities that they they have been part of. And I'm sure there, there are more groups too, but um, it is happening and um, not on a general level, but in places. Thank you. On this particular question, as the moderator, I, I have been very disciplined in keeping myself out of the conversation. However, I must interject one point here. I will simply say that 
if we're considering this question of decolonization, I strongly believe that form follows function. And if we are proposing an alternative function of decolonization within our institution, we need to challenge the nature of the form, the structure, the organization of the current academy. And is it the structure that we need in order to implement a different kind of vision and mission. But we have um, other questions and I'd like to move to those. Um, here's another uh, question and there is a linked component to this. Um, it states, it seems to me that there is a lack of meaningful inclusivity in our school. How can we get together focus on people of color when our own school doesn't seem to try to do anything besides saying it will be anti-racist. Just calling ourselves anti-racist is cheap talk if there is no implementation in our courses and our programs. It seems like people of color students are used more to bolster the school statistics of diversity rather than trying to fix what's wrong with how we treat race. And there is a critique in the fact of wanting to be even more involved in our process here of engagement uh, with the questioning process. Additionally, there is a, another question which says, how, how do I, as a student, talk to a professor about the wrong language they use toward my race when it has happened more than once and I've already corrected them a few times. How do I engage the professor? Who would like to uh, answer either of the components of those questions? Celine, yes, thank yeah. you. I'm gonna, I'm sorry, I'm a bit nervous. So sometimes I think I'm not saying- You're everything. doing just fine. Okay. Um, I do agree uh, that, you know, the, in terms of the first question, um, I think that UMass Boston, the potential of what it could be um, to go against um, generally how, the, how um, academia is portrayed is that because we are a public institution and because of the communities that we serve, it could be um, an infrastructure to prepare um, a mass of black students and, and of course, um, everyone in between, uh, and by extension, like I said, um, the BIPOC community and so on and so forth um, for long-term resistance and collective decision-making or governance. But that can't happen um, if we are, um, if for one thing there isn't a space where students feel um, that they can, you know, find some place that they can identify with and speak on whatever issues that they are facing, um, where their interests can be met, where there is a space for them to either um, empower or educate or agitate or mandate interests that, you know, best suit um, their identity. Um, and, uh, and so, okay, I'm sorry, I might, I'll have to come back. I'm a bit nervous. You're doing just fine. You're doing just fine. Would anyone else like to comment? I can add something. Um, and yes, yeah, Celine, you're doing great. In fact, I'm going to, uh, just pick, pick up on a little bit of what you were saying. Um, there's been a little talk of uh, uh, the cipher, so I, I want to just uh, mention that quickly because I think it helps to address this question. Um, when uh, earlier in the summer, uh, immediately after uh, George Floyd's murder, I uh, sent an email to the entire department, faculty, staff, and students, and saying basically, uh, Talk is cheap, right? We've had a uh, social justice mission in 
the leadership and education department for 30 years. Um, and I think we've uh, done a really good job of demonstrating that commitment. But we can do a lot more. And we could do a lot more towards really advancing racial justice. And so that's why we came together in the Cypher. Um, and for those of you who don't know, uh, the Cypher is uh, basically uh, a collective. It comes from uh, the hip hop community when uh, rappers and dancers and DJs came together um, to cipher, to share knowledge um, and to share lyrics. And so that's what we do as an academic community of faculty, staff and students. And in the cipher, there's, there's no hierarchy. Um, students have just uh, as much right and uh, ability to not only contribute to the cipher, but also lead the cipher. So although I convened it initially, uh, we've been meeting every week since June. And most of the time, those sessions have been led by students. And we have representation from every program. We have four programs in the department. Every program is represented. Uh, like I said, faculty are there, uh, students and staff. Um, and so that's a group that we are trying to really uh, not just talk the talk, but walk the walk. And frankly, we're holding ourselves accountable by looking at our policies and looking at our practices and our teaching and our learning. And someone else mentioned this, so I'll just mention that um, in the discussion, in fact, it was the students who said, hey, you know what? There's a lot we can do, but there's a lot we cannot do if the university as a whole doesn't change. And so we developed uh, the Cypher report, Co contributed by uh, nearly 70 uh, members uh, and delivered it uh, to the chancellor with uh, a, about 20 some odd demands um, that we wanted to see to create change. And so that's just one way uh, that we've been trying to really walk the walk and do the work. Um, and again, we, we can't do it alone, but we, we're trying to focus on our own sphere of influence to create change. And Thank you very much. I, I, can I just add the second question you had about the student yes. who was um, talking to a faculty member? Uh, I'm really sad to hear that story because we hear those stories way too many times across the university. And so um, as a department chair, I'll just be frank and say that I would like to hear about that. If, uh, if a student is going to a faculty member and they're not responsive, um, then I would want to know about it. And I would hope that my colleagues as other department chairs would also want to know about it and have a conversation with that faculty member to take the burden off of the student. And we have to do more of that too. We, we have to uh, call our, our faculty, tenured, non-tenured, tenure track, it doesn't matter. We need to also, as department chairs, talk to our faculty and our faculty colleagues have to hold each other accountable. So that's my advice to the student. Could Thank I jump you very in? much. Jim and Dari, could I jump in yes. on what yes. Tara said? I, I think she's absolutely right that the student who, who feels that a faculty member is in some way not hearing what they're saying. I mean, obviously you speak to the faculty member first, but if, you, if you're not getting anywhere from talking to the faculty member about it, then you go to the department chair. There's a whole academic chain of command. If you if you find that you're not getting anywhere talking to an act to the department chair, you go to your dean. If you don't um, get anywhere there, you go to the provost, which is me. Um, we we are very very concerned to make sure that our faculty um, deal respectfully with students of all races, colors, creeds, ethnicities. It, sexualities, whatever. Um, and so the, there are um, consequences often if faculty cannot be teachable about how to, uh, to address students in this sort of way. So I would not, I would counsel students not to be overly shy or reticent about taking a complaint like that up the line. I think people 
the department chairs will be very tactful. It's, it's not going to put you into an embarrassed position. It's just going to be something that maybe you can help teach your faculty member something. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we have a few minutes only in this uh, opening session. Now we've covered a lot of ground, a lot of issues have been raised. Um, I would like to um, remind our audience that this is the first of our discussions. Um, the next conversation will be on Thursday, October the 29th, same time, 6.30. And we will engage the theme in that discussion of campus and community, broadening an anti-racist and health promoting vision. And we'll be expanding upon uh, some of the issues that were raised here. I'd like to give our panelists, however, 30 seconds in closing. There's been a lot of challenges raised, but I'd like you to address in your 30 seconds as we close, we will go back in the same order we began, of what are the two most important opportunities facing our campus now? What are our opportunities? Provost McDermott. Well, you know, I'm sure other people will think of, of, of other opportunities that may be more, um, absolutely to the point but the opportunity i feel i have some say over is who gets hired as our faculty um over the next couple of years and and i am um i think the way that you move from being racist is by be, by bringing your faculty more into line with your student body. The racial composition of the faculty should be more in line with the racial composition of the student body. And so we're very committed right now to, um, to ways of redressing some of the issues Tara mentioned specifically um, about faculty uh, being able to hire and retain faculty of color, uh, promote faculty of color, mentor them through to um, tenure and promotion. And, and those are the things that I'm very um, committed to. Thank you. Professor Sieber. Um, Your 30 seconds. Yeah. Um, I think one of the most interesting things that I read in the Cypher report was a very strong case to be made for um, evaluating employees, faculty, and also administrators more on their contributions to um, enhancing racial justice on campus. And um, seeing that as kind of a goal that really relates to our most fundamental, most, uh, most deep purposes that we have for being here. And um, that didn't come up for discussion, but also I think white people have to listen more to faculty of color and follow their leadership um, on these issues. It's, it's, uh, that's long overdue. Um, Thank you. Professor Parker. Okay, 30 seconds. Um, first, I would say uh, we have to capitalize on this time right now. We have a lot of discussion. So um, those of you who haven't been a part of the discussion, let's get you involved and let's come together to capitalize on this opportunity that we have right now. And one of those ways, I'm gonna give a shout out to uh, Keith Jones um, and Tony Vandermeer for uh, bringing us together here tonight, but also um, by putting together uh, what we call the Undoing Racism Assembly, which is a coalition of coalitions. And uh, that's a fantastic opportunity. And again, we need to get uh, more students involved uh, and lastly, quick shout out, anyone who wants to uh, receive a copy of the Cypher report, uh, just because it's been mentioned multiple times here, I'm happy to uh, share a copy. Excellent, thank you. <clears throat> now, Paul? Uh, so I think we have this opportunity, like Tara said, because of the moment that we're in, we can definitely 
change the conversation. We have, we have the change the debate, kind of take up everything and sort of redirect all of the things that people thought they knew and all of the, the uh, you know, between our stories and our experience. Uh, do what we hear, what, what, what the second thing is for me is to be what we are. It's an academic institution. We educate. We're educators. So we need to seize this moment, set out to change the course that we're going and educate people and have them be informed. Thank you. So they can continue. Professor Kruger Henning. I'd like to challenge us a little bit uh, on, on, on how we perceive uh, our intentions, perhaps with increasing uh, hiring and also retaining BIPOC faculty and staff and students, of course, uh, only because we hire them doesn't mean their university knows what to do with us. Why would they want to stay, try to find their happiness, their professional health with us, and also be loyal to UMass Boston when perhaps a materialized priority plan is not in place for them? So I say all this because I also would like to hear from the administrative levels and spaces to hear about materializing commitments to this kind of work because it does take a material basis to put this into fruition. Thank you. Uh, Celine, our opportunities. I think um, as like during this time, I think a lot of students are waking up and realizing um, what barriers they are facing being a part of you, not being a part of UMass Boston, but being either a working class student, um, having to do, being an immigrant, being a person of color. Um, so I think this is the time, again, uh, to take this opportunity um, for students to join in other student groups, join in the UMB coalition, um, and make spaces where they can actually um, be a part of the decision-making process. And again, to go against, um, to go in addition to what Patricia was saying, um, in terms of the administration, um, to make it clear that we are the we are uh, the stakeholders of this university, and that uh, if we are able to um, unite and and talk about the different ways in which we wish to uh, to see a new form of UMass Boston, that we can bring it up to the table. You must. We there's already been demands that have been set, um, demands that have been asked from different student centers. Um, and, and, you know, it is, it is one way that we can start actually um, using our voices. Thank you. And Dean Thompson. Sure, I see a, a wonderful opportunity to empower our students with information on helping them with self-care. Right now, so many students of color are, are having problems with mental health. We really need to, uh, to use this opportunity to, to teach them and to empower them on, on self-care. And, um, and we're working on that right now. We're working on also recruiting more people of color in our college. Thank you very much. I'd like to take that last question and also pose that to those who participated in our audience this evening. We have an extraordinary opportunity as a university community that lays before us and will only be met by our actions, by what we do. In order to host this this evening, we've, I think, exercised uh, extraordinary discipline. We're only a cu couple of minutes over our allotted time. I'd like to thank all of you on the panel for your participation, for your insights, for raising some of these critical issues and helping to guide the conversation that will move us forward. I'd like to thank all of you who have, uh, hundreds of you, in fact, who have been online with us in this opening conversation to encourage you to uh, be with us again on October the 29th. I'd like to thank the UMass Boston IT department who made this technologically possible and my colleagues, Professor 
uh, Keith Jones and Tony Vandermeer, my colleagues in the Africana Studies Department, and all of my other colleagues who are engaged in activism on our campus and in our community to help to move these ideas forward and to make our campus community a better place for all of us. Thank you for your participation this evening. We will see you on October the 29th.